Thank you. Thank you. Resonating through all of our hearts and minds. We have one response. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we thank the Lord for our time together. Let's pray. Father, we come before you well aware that we are all sinners and we all fall short of your glory. And with thankfulness and gratitude and gratefulness on our hearts, we just lift up your name and praise you for who you are. We praise you for sending your son to live a perfect life, to suffer on our behalf and to die, to pay the price for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for the work of the Spirit that is amongst us here and now. We thank you, Lord, for the power that exists in your word and I am asking God right now, and together we all ask with one voice that we would hear from you, that I would hear from you, that, that my words would be your words, that your words would be mine. Father, I pray for people that are here, perhaps ones that cannot be here, that are listening online, that need encouragement and strength and comfort in the midst of fearful and uncertain times. We thank you, Lord, that you are real, that you're present, and in your sovereignty, you are most powerful. And we thank you that we can call you our Heavenly Father, Father. Please, Lord, I ask for help that you would speak the words that you want and that you'd guard my mind and my mouth. Thank you for this church. Thank you for each person that's here. May you be glorified. We ask this in the amazing and wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Romans, if you recall a book of what I call gravitas. It has, gra it has weight to it. Romans is a book of utmost importance. Last week we introduced it to you. We know that within its pages, it's often viewed as a foundation posting theological stanchions of orthodox biblical Christianity. We talk about the fact that we will see within its pages, as we saw last week, that what? The Trinity is present here. We have lessons on our triune God. We have been set apart for the gospel of God concerning his son, according to the spirit of holiness. We, we learn things that are important for us to learn. We will also learn about the doctrine of sin and salvation. We'll learn the truth regarding the scriptures, the word of God. And I think it is most important for us to realize, as I told you last week, and I agree with many others that have come before me, that God has richly blessed the lives of those people who have dedicated themselves to the study of this book. God has richly blessed the lives of people who have said, I want to learn more. Speaking of that, do you remember a homework assignment that was given to you? Do you remember some work that I encouraged you uh, to read through the entirety of Romans chapter 1? It was a busy week, pastor, and things got... No, 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 hold on one moment. It has been exactly 168 hours that have passed since the last time I stood up here before you. Since that time, there has been 10,080 minutes have transpired. You'll never get them back. I'm a slow reader, and I read Romans chapter 1 multiple times this week, and it averages about 3 minutes and 26 seconds. I felt kind of fleshly timing that, but I wanted that information for you. 
We have got to dedicate some time to the study of this book. Why? Because we are living in an era, we're living in a day, in a time where there are many people, not just in the world, but that, that, that exist and abide in churches today that are floating off, that are drifting off into fluffiness and relativism. Absolute truth is needed absolutely. We talked about the fact that the Apostle Paul, formerly what thug, scholar, saw, was the author, written about 57 A.D. And we looked last week at the credentials that Paul says. I'm not just like some guy that picked up a pen here. He has credentials. He is what introduced as a servant of Jesus. All of his successes aside, he is a servant first and foremost. I wonder if you can say that. Your name, your name, blank, fill it in, a servant. I'm just here to serve Jesus. Paul says what? He was called to be an apostle, a unique office reserved for only those that have been directly called by Jesus himself, which gives him some authority to write, some authority to speak. Paul introduced himself as one who has been set apart for the gospel. We talked about that, a message of such good news. We proclaim there's a proclamation of redemption. You don't hold on to good news, you share good news. That's what Paul wants to do. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. Follow along. The words will be in front of you. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. I'll read down through verse 15 for our text today before we dive into it. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is proclaimed in all the worlds. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at least succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I, I, I do not, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Last week we looked at Paul's credentials. This week we're going to look at Paul's concern. Now if you recall a little bit just by way of a setting, in our introduction this is a letter that has been written to a group of believers. It's a local church that is in the city of Rome. Paul has never met them. He has been preaching and planting churches in the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. And what he desires to do is he wants to move west to the western portion to Rome and then further on into Spain because he knows that the gospel always goes forth. It must go forth to all the nations. And what we cannot help but notice is what began last week is a very solid it's almost a scholastic, and I would say it's almost a sterile introduction. We looked last week at what? He's verifying his apostolic authority, a very thorough description of the gospel. But then there's, there's something that happens this week. There's a, there's a transition in his tone. It becomes a, a tone of, of gentleness. And, and there's a tone of, of care. There's a, a tone of love. There's so much emotion that, is, that, that are in these words. First, I thank my God for you. Without ceasing, without stopping, I'm praying for you. I long to see you. I don't want you to be unaware. I've tried hard. I've, I've often intended to come to you. This is not the language of some what kind of cruel 
uncaring, critical, cynical person. This is not the tone here of a tyrant. This is what? This is the heart of a loving shepherd. He is opening up his heart so that they can see and hear his concern. The reason is this. He has gotten word that there's some problems in the church of Rome. There's actually some friction. People are judging one another. There's, there's division and conflict over doctrinal distinctives. Jewish believers versus Gentile believers. And Jewish believers want to return to what? The celebration of feasts and festivals and dietary laws and celebrating the Sabbath. So what's happened is that people are actually judging one another like, I'm more spiritual than you are. I'm right, you're wrong. Does that ever, could that ever exist in the context of a local church? Oh, for people in churches to sit here and say, I just have a little bit more in my tank than you do. That, that actually happens. Person, I believe one of the greatest scars to the work of the gospel in our society today is the testimony of a fractured, arguing, bickering church within the community. People, we've got to realize here what? We are all family. We've all been called. We've all been rescued and redeemed. We've all been set apart. So there is, there is no place for division. There's no place for infighting. And the, the, the enemy loves to sow the seeds of discord. And it can be anything. Anything can be used. Political differences and divide. Uh, signs posted all over people's lawns. You think there's an opportunity here for the enemy to sow some seeds of discord? Doctrinal distinctives. Racial divide. Even, even a philosophical approach to, 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 to ministry. It doesn't matter. The enemy will use it's like, like a, just, just a grenade that he wants to send off. Dividing and destroying churches. Later on in, in Romans, in chapter 14 and chapter 15, we're going to read about the fact that what as for the one who is weak in his faith, welcome him. It actually says what? Not to quarrel over opinions. God has welcomed us. It says what? That we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. You realize it says in Romans chapter 3, all of us are sinners. All of us fall short of God's glory. When you walked into church this morning, some of you noticed it. Perhaps most of you did not. But in our entrance, in our foyer, in our lobby, there are giant words that literally are what? Painted on the wall. And it says this, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. You see, the idea of a church is that we're to be characterized and cradled in love for one another. But, but it's not an excuse to ignore sin. So this is the balance that Paul is trying to strike here. In love, but yet with apostolic authority, he has to confront, he has to speak truth. He needs to address and he seeks to correct the division of what really is errant or bad teaching or bad theology that has crept into the church. Bad theology in a church is like cancer in the body. Some of you who have suffered, some of you who are survivors know exactly what I'm speaking about with the devastating destruction that cancer brings on your body. That's what bad theology is in the local church. Eating and destroying. Therefore, there is always a matter of urgency to address it. Think for a moment if you were to go to the doctor and they begin to order more tests and more tests, more blood work. We're going to bring you in again. And, and, and you have been given a diagnosis. 
And as a result of that diagnosis, the prognosis is not good. There's a moment of consultation. Doc brings in and says, yeah, we're looking at this and it, it doesn't look good. Results of the MRI, the results of the blood work. And he says, I, I hate to say this, but it doesn't look good. As a matter of fact, it looks bad. And I have to be honest with you, it looks really, really bad. Doc says this, don't worry, I've got some good news here. Because I have an opening for surgery, I have an opening for treatment to begin. And he gets his assistant and says, yeah, it looks like, it looks like right now we have an opening early April, the 8th. It's a Tuesday, 8 o'clock in the morning. Would you be free then? If, if you had a diagnosis, the result is what? This is bad. And he gives you an appointment six months from now, you're going to say, no, doc, that's not good. That's not going to work. That doesn't work here. Get me somebody else. Get me out of here. Likewise, what? We've got to sense the urgency to what Paul is saying with these words. I long to see you in verse 11. I'm eager to preach to you in verse 15. Why? Something's happening here. There's a disunity, a disharmony, a splintering sin that has been left. And it is the most damaging and it is the most dangerous to the life and health of a local church. Therefore, what we have got to be strong. We've got to be healthy. We've got to be shining as bright lights in a dark world. Therefore, sin must, must, must be confronted. I learned this by example. My father-in-law, Edward George Henderson, passed away just last year, last spring. Was a pastor for more than 20 years. And having a, a father-in-law as a pastor is kind of terrifying at some levels when you're a pastor. But also it is an amazing, amazing blessing. Because I'm like, hey, yo, grandpa, what's up with this? How do I handle this? Grandpa Henderson not only was led to the Lord as a child by an older woman, his Sunday school teacher from East Hodgton Bible Church, East Hodgton, Maine. What's interesting is that that Sunday school teacher actually took him through as a child through the book of Romans. As a result, Grandpa loved the book of Romans, clearly his most favorite book to, to dig into, to search and study and to teach and preach from it. At one particular point in his life, he was called to a church and he was very quickly made aware that there was an issue, there was a problem in the church. It was a matter of sin and it was within the context of the leadership and it had been left there. Some people wanted to address it, and others did not. And so there's division, there's, there's, there's friction, there's factions. So what did Grandpa do? He said, well, I'm going to take a year, year and a half, I'm just going to pray about this. No, he didn't. No, he did not. Took another elder with him, and he went directly to the one who was a brother in the Lord who was living in sin and he knocked on his door and with heartache and, and with the utmost of care and concern he said you you are living wrong you're living in sin you're trying to hide it and as a result of that some people actually want to hide it too and it can't be hidden and what it has to be addressed and it has to be addressed now. That's Paul's concern here. He has a legitimate concern. How does he handle it? How does he proceed? Such grace. Such care. Such concern. And such love. I'm actually reminded of how Paul in another book, in Galatians, in chapter 6, how, how he acknowledges the fact that sin is also present in another church. And he actually gives instruction on how we do this. He says this in, in Galatians chapter 6. If anyone is caught in any transgression, in any sin, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 
He adds, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's all built around this idea of restoration, to restore. Katartizo is the word in, in Greek. It literally means to bring back to a former condition. It, it actually carries with it oftentimes the connotation of how a doctor would reset or restore a bone that was broken. One week ago, Dallas Cowboys are playing New York Giants. Dak, Dak Prescott, the quarterback for the Cowboys, and some of you saw this, and some of you did exactly what I did. Like, you look away. Whoa! That is horrible. That is ugly. When his ankle, what? Completely is destroyed. What, what had to happen? Literally, immediately, immediately, that very night, he gets, he gets carted off, and he gets put into surgery, and what does that doctor do? With gentleness, it has to be, but there has to be a degree of strength to rebuild, to replace, to reset, to restore this horrifically broken bone. That's, that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He doesn't attack. Instead, what he wants to do is, number one, encourage them personally. Even though it's, it's, a, it's a setting that is not good. It's a setting that's going to need some correction. It's a setting that, that needs to be restored. It's a, it's a broken bone that needs to be reset. What does he do? He wants to encourage them personally. And he says it, he begins with, first of all, I just thank God for you. I thank God for all of you. Notice that, that little tiny three-letter word, all of you. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish, doesn't matter if you're Gentile. Doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, white, black, doesn't matter. I thank God for you. And then what he does is that he finds the positive and he says, I've heard uh, of your faithfulness. You're meeting together. You're gathering together. You're being taught the word of God. You're making disciples. I've heard of your faithfulness. It's known. And then he says this, and I love this. And let's hold on to this. He says, I am praying for you. I can't stop praying for you. Last night I was awoke in the middle of the night with a name in my head and I had to pray for that person. That's what Paul's saying here. I can't stop praying for you. I just want you to think for a moment right now with your own life and the way that you encourage, the way that you pour into other people's lives. What, what, what does it look like? What does it look like for you to encourage some? Here is a, here's a good, here's a great model for you that we can follow. And have to be certain, this is done with sincerity. Sincerely, he's offering his encouragement and his prayers. It's not being done quickly. It's not being done flippantly. But it's important and it's needed words of truth. A phone call that you have made. A text. I just need to send a word off. Some of you what are, are card writers. And praise God for that ministry. For years and years and years, I have kept a Nike shoebox underneath our bed. And when someone writes me a note or sends me a card, you, you do not realize, you do not realize the significance and the weight and the importance of those words of encouragement. And, and, and for you, I put them in that Nike shoebox, and I filled that box up, and I got another one. And I filled that one up. And, and I have, and I cherish these notes and words of encouragement. That's the weight and significance that we can have as we encourage one another. Why is this important? Not only to encourage them personally, but Paul says, I want to be encouraged by them. This is very important. This is not a one-sided relationship here. Superman, Paul. I'm just here to save the world. It's not like that. Paul adds, I long to see that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. 
Oh, how many times do we see without, throughout the pages of Scripture the one another's, the, the, the serve one another, to give to one another, to love one another, to encourage one another. That's what this is about. Paul's not saying, well, I'm only here for you. He's saying we need one another. We need to be together. The apostle, this is the apostle, all of the weight and, and authority of his office, gifts beyond measure. We would hold up the apostle and say, if only, and Paul is leaning in and he's saying this, I need you. We have been in a most interesting season over the past six months. We know as well that I have been very clear and very bold about the importance of us worshiping together. We were a season where we were online because we were instructed, well, we can't be together for fear of sickness, and so we want to be wise and cautious. Some people are still battling significant uh, conditions that would not allow them to be here. And so we obviously and always encourage people, if it's not safe for you, if it's not wise for you, then you cannot be here. And I fully understand that. But what has happened as well is that we've actually come through this season where there's a tremendous convenience to saying, you know what, yeah, it's been a long week and I was up pretty late, so I'm just going to stay home. And I'm just going to worship in my bathrobe, and we're going to go to church online. A wonderful blessing, and there's needed seasons for that, but there's also what a needed season for us to literally and physically be together. If Christ is the head and we are the body, how, how effective is a body? How much does a body function if there's limbs that are missing? Therefore, we all need to be together. We need you. How, how is this going to happen? What does this look like? In this particular case that Paul is referring to, it, it has a purpose to strengthen them spiritually. I long to impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Now we know that Paul's gift is what? Is a desire to serve. And Paul's gifting is that he has the ability to offer a strong, clear, healthy diet of doctrinal truth through his teaching and through his preaching to correct errant theology, to bring, to offer offer unity and oneness in the midst of divisiveness. And Paul's going to do this through the gifts that has been given to him. But we know, as we kind of reminded the little ones earlier this morning, as much as we delight in receiving a gift, we know that gifts are designed to be given out. When we've been given a gift, and you're to use it. For the glory of God. And we know that there's gifts that differ. We'll talk about that later on in Romans chapter 12. Some people have the ability, what, to be teachers or preachers? To have that shepherding or that pastoral heart? Others of you are gifted in ways to, to serve or to give or to sacrifice or to come alongside and encourage or exhort or to build up whatever it is. When you have acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he says, I have this for you. And the Holy Spirit imparts to us an amazing gift, not to hold on to it, but to share it. That's exactly what Paul is doing. He desires what? In eagerness to preach the gospel to all of you who are in Rome. He longs to do this. It's almost like if he can't do it, then a part of him is not functioning properly. We've got to be together in our life, in our service to King Jesus. Why? To reap some harvest among you. There's something that God wants to do. And do you see what's happening here? The greatest encouragement that you can be to another person is to use what God has given to you. 
to, to stop looking at others and, and comparing. If I could just sing like this person, if I could speak like this person, if I had the empathy and the mercy that this one had. Stop. God has gifted you, uh, Spirit-filled you to be the person that God has designed for you to be. All of it doing with a purpose, what? Back to Galatians chapter 6, to restore, to bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. How, how, how are you doing in that one area? I, 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 I want to say this with the utmost of care and concern, like, like the model that is given before us. But I have to wonder, why are we not turning people away for the needs that we have in ministry as opposed to still saying we have needs here that, that are open that still need to be filled? Why is it that people have been receiving and, and, and have been given gifts and, and you're holding on to them? And you show up for an hour on Sunday and, and you call it good. That's not good. So at some level, we have to speak into one another's lives with care and concern and gentleness. And we do this, not, not flippantly, but in sincerity, in gratitude and love and with prayers. We do this with a sense of, of urgency here. I remind you, that, that clock never stops. 10,080 minutes. You just blew. And I wonder how many of you spent 3 minutes and 28 seconds reading Romans chapter 1. We do this with a sense of, of relevancy. We've got to connect with one another. We're addressing what, the problem the right way. Know who you're speaking to. Know what makes them tick. Sit down and listen. What they're worried about. It says that we're to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. And what? We have to communicate with clarity. Precisely. Knowing the problem, but also understanding the solution. What does Paul say? I can't wait to get to I got to get to the gospel. I got to get to the gospel. I got to get to the gospel. That's why he is so urgent here. The fact that there is a holy God and we are most unholy, and yet God in his care and in his love and his sovereign grace has sent his only begotten son that whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life that enables us to have a relationship as sinful people with a holy God. The solution is in the gospel. We have been in the midst of this pandemic, and there is, and I heard the phrase just this past week, there is pandemic fatigue. We've all like, okay, when are we, go like, is this done yet? Are we over this? At this moment, apparently not. As much as we're all done with it, there's pandemic fatigue. We have to show care and concern. We have to love. There is what? Economic uncertainty. I was in Northern Virginia this past week, and, and a place that is just normally bustling in activity with high rises and office buildings, every single, and I'm not exaggerating, every office building somewhere has a sign, space for lease, office space for lease. Everyone's working from home. The place is dead. The place is dead. We have no idea to the economic fallout and uncertainty. Political exasperation. I am so sick, as I know I'm not the only one. Just turn off the news is the best advice I can give you. And there's this sense of what we're just exasperated by all of it. Those things can cause what I think is causing a spiritual dryness and a deadness. And God forbid, in apathy. Therefore, the moment for togetherness, I don't believe has ever been more needed, has ever been more important. The, the idea of awareness. You're, you're not the only one. Understand, understand that you're going through some difficult times, but you're not the only one going through difficult times. Look around. Togetherness, awareness, a connectedness. 
And perhaps most importantly is a faithfulness, is a faithfulness. It's interesting that Paul concludes with this language, language of it's, it's agrarian, it's an agricultural language, it's, it's farming talk. Why? That we may reap some harvest among you. Well, go back to when you visited Grandpa's farm. And you remember the process of plowing and preparing. You remember the process of planting the fields. And waiting, just waiting. And praying, praying that it would water, that it would rain. And we know that what? We, we have zero control. We can do all the work and we have zero control as far as what's going to come up and what's going to come out and what's going to be given. That's why Paul concludes with this, that we together may reap some harvest among you together. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we haven't even, we haven't even, we haven't even stepped into the shallow water of the theological and doctrinal truths that we, we will learn about. We're just preparing for that. We're still in the introduction. But as we, introduce, as we wade our way in, we've got to set the tone of how we do this and the importance and the priority of doing this together more than ever before. Now, all of this is cradled. All of this is couched in the incredible work that the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. And I am so thankful that this text of Scripture aligns with the day that we just pause, everything stops, and in quietness, there is a degree of awkwardness to remembering the communion table. Good, good. I'm glad it's awkward for you. Because as awkward as it is for you, think of how painful, painstaking it was for the Lord. Now we know what exactly took place. We read it in scripture. Jesus Christ was meeting with his disciples. His entire earthly ministry is coming to a culmination and, and, and he knows what's going to happen. Let's, let's go to that upper room. Jesus is meeting with those that are closest to him. He, he, he knows that he will suffer and die. He knows that he will leave them and he speaks to them. And not only does he speak to them, but he gives to them something that we have before us today, that we need before us. Matthew chapter 26, let's go to that upper room. Listen very carefully now as they were eating. Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And said, take, eat. This is my body. He took a cup when he had given thanks. He, he gave it to them also, saying, Drink of it, all of you. Listen to this. Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the covenant. A promise which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of vine until that day when I drink it in, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is drawing all the attention in the midst of terror that his followers, his disciples are in. He draws their attention to this, this piece of bread and this, this cup of wine. And he says, this is, this is a picture for you. And we understand that we are individuals that we remember things when we can touch it. We remember things that, that we, can, we can smell and we remember things and we can taste them. So that's exactly what Jesus Christ does. He takes some bread and it wasn't a beautiful piece of bread like this. It was, it was unleavened bread. So there was no yeast in it. It was flat. It was flat. And as an object lesson... He held it up in, in front of these 12, and he broke it. And as he broke it, he said, this is, my, this is a picture of my body. Just as this piece of bread is being broken, my body is going to be wrecked. It's going to be broken, whipped and, and pierced. 
nailed. He said, I want you to eat this. Some false doctrines would say that it actually turns into the, the, the body of Jesus when you ingest it. That's, that's not true. It's a piece of bread. Jesus also took, what, the fruit of the vine and he, he poured it out. And as he poured it out, he said, this is a picture of my blood. And we just read about in, in, in Matthew chapter 26 that it's because of the blood that the forgiveness of our sins is made real. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And he passed it out. They clearly would have broken COVID protocol. Pro protocol. They, they, they clearly would have not been social distancing because they probably drank from a common cup. You know what that means? I'll take a sip. You can have a sip. And you pass it. You pass it. It's not the mode, okay? It's not how it's done. It's the fact that we have a moment to remember that Jesus' body was broken for you and his blood was poured out for you. Why? Because he loved you so much. He wanted you to hold on to this reminder. And that's why we gather as a church. We are defined as those who've been called, set apart with a purpose, and we are defined by the fact that we remember the sacraments of the community table. That's who we are. He says, do this often, often, often in remembrance of me. Don't forget, don't forget. There's going to be a lot of things out there that are going to draw your mind and your attention away, your affections away. Come back to this and come back to this. And that's why we do this. Now, we don't take communion in order to be saved. Matter of fact, we take it because we have been saved. And so I'm going to remind you that if you are here today, and you've not acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ, like he's a swear word to you, or he's a good guy, but you've not acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, then with the utmost of respect, I do not want to be rude, but I would ask that you not take this. Please don't. But if you have acknowledged the Lord, and today, it says what in 2 Corinthians, is the day of salvation, that today... We can acknowledge the fact that we are broken sinners in need of the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that apart from him, there is no hope. And today you can put your faith and your trust in Jesus. I would encourage you, I would love for you to do that. And then this is yours to celebrate and to commemorate what Jesus Christ has done. Now, we know that it's a little bit different. I'm going to ask the elders and deacons, those that are going to come up, and, and just so that you understand, it's, it's going to look a little bit different today. Pastor, job, Pastor Josh did an excellent job on explaining to us what we're going to do. And so, so they're going to serve you without kind of touching every single thing. So they'll have gloves on, and we're going to just take a moment in quietness to kind of pray and prepare our hearts to receive this. So there are several stations in the back and also in the front. And, and the guys will serve you the bread first. And then you can come back to your seat and we'll pray and we'll receive that together. And then they'll serve you the cup. But you'll have to come up out of your seat to walk to one of these stations to, to, to be given it. Rather than it coming around to you. Hope you understand that so that we don't pass it and touch it um, with one another. But more than how it's done, we're remembering why we do this and what this is a picture of and celebrating and commemorating the incredible gift of salvation that Jesus Christ offers to us through his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's just take a moment to quiet our hearts. When the time is right, you can come forward and Receive the elements, and then we will pray and ask God's blessing upon it.
Did everyone receive elements for communion? I wanted to. Thank you, brothers, for serving. Would you bow your heads and, and pray with me? Father, again, we are just, we're just most grateful for who you are and what you have done on our behalf in offering. I, I cannot imagine the very thought of, of offering my son. And yet you did that because he saw us you know us, you love us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for his body that was broken. We thank you, Lord, for this bread that is a picture of that. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that was poured out, that offers, pays the price through death for our sins. We thank you for the cup that is a picture of that. Bless each one of us. Speak to us. If we have areas that we need to confess, if we have ones that we need to go to, I pray, Lord, that we would strive to be one. We would show love and care and concern for others, for one another, as you have shown for us. We ask this now in the amazing and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, it's Paul writing and he gives description as far as instruction. He says that the Lord Jesus, in the very night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this. Eat this in remembrance of me. It says, in the same way also he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Drink this. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread. As often as you drink this cup. We are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. And oh, how we look forward to when he comes again. Go and lead us. Amen.